The Gang of Four It was a fine spring morning, and Morgana was enjoying the peace and quiet of the early sunshine, watching as the sun dried the dew wherever its rays fell among the long shadows. There were no humans about, and not even another cat at that moment. Just a few birds chirped high up in the trees. Now and then an annoying pigeon would clatter to the grass and peck at some seeds that had fallen from the bird feeder. Morgana was in the apple tree, surveying her empire. Okay, it was partly Moriarty's too, but he didn't count. Moriarty nosed his way out of the cat flap from the kitchen into the garden, sat in the middle of the patio and yawned. Morgana eyed him with contempt. Although he was her twin brother, she was the older and, of course, was a princess. She had to be. Dad kept telling her she was. That meant the empire was hers. All would be good, she mused, but there was a slight problem. Okay, it was a large problem. A new cat had appeared in the neighbourhood recently, and Morgana had caught him wandering through her realm. The first time he had run off. He was the new kid on the block, after all. But this morning he had sneered at her and merely sauntered off slowly. Morgana called to her brother below. Hey, Moriarty, have you seen that new cat, the big white one? Moriarty looked up, spotted Morgana through the blossom of the apple tree and nodded. Yes, big brute. I wouldn't want to meet him in a dark alley. I've nicknamed him the Great White. Morgana tutted. Well, he came into our land this morning. I think he's going to come back. I don't want to fight, but... Wise words, Morgana. He's big, with rippling muscles. Live and let live, I say. Let him in. Why can't we all just get along? Oh, you and your new ideas. Of course we can't let him in. He'll think he owns the place. Something must be done. Moriarty considered her logic then yawned again. He had a very laid-back attitude, and was generally happy to just see what happened. So what are you going to do? Take him on? He's twice your size, even if you do fluff yourself up. Morgana bridled. Well, I thought you might, you know, see him off, you being the big strong man of the house. Moriarty stared at her with narrowing eyes. Oh, I see. I get mauled by the big white claw machine. No thanks. Look, why not have a word with him? I'm sure he'll understand and keep out of your way. Under his breath, Moriarty added, I sure try to. Morgana scowled. This was not going the way she had planned. She tried one last tack. How about we both corner him? I'll do the talking. You just lurk, looking mean. Moriarty laughed. Me? Look mean? He considered it for a moment. Okay, so I'm fit. But I reckon Great White could take us both. It needs more thought, Morgana. I don't think it's going to be that easy. But he's new. He doesn't know us. If we strike now, he will be scared of us. If we wait, he will get bolder. Moriarty scratched his chin. There was some merit in what Morgana was saying. There was an uneasy truce among the current cats in the neighbourhood, partly because they had all been there a while and had got used to whose territory was whose, but also because none of them wanted trouble. There was an occasional scrap, but it was mostly just howling, no actual claws, and sometimes it was just for show for the humans. In fact, Moriarty got on well with the other cats, especially Ginge, who lived two doors down, they chatted amiably quite often. Ginge had been complaining about his food the other day. Well, Mum put down this dried muck, no meat. Well, I wasn't having any of it. I left it and meowed all evening. I appealed to Dad's usual good nature. I felt he was backing me up, but today, more dried filth. I heard her tell Dad that I was too fat from eating the proper stuff. Me, fat? Can you believe it, Moriarty, me old mucker? Moriarty had winced. Ginge was a bit porky, but a friend was a friend. Cruel, Ginge, cruel. 
You shouldn't have to take that kind of talk. It's not as if your mum is that slim herself. Ginge and he had chuckled about that for a while. Then there was the black and white kitten over the road, Jiminy. He was no trouble, too small to threaten anyone, and was quite happy keeping out of their way. Sometimes Mia, the Siamese, wandered through their garden. She was very slinky and cold and kept herself to herself, but she always asked nicely if she could come through, though. So, apart from Vinny, the Jack Russell next door, it was an easy-going and fairly carefree life for the local cats. Everyone avoided Vinny's garden. He was a yappy little mutt who chased anything that came in and barked like he'd caught some burglar. It was easy to go round his garden, though, and fortunately Vinny couldn't roam anywhere he pleased as they could. But all that might change with the coming of the Great White. Moriarty went straight to the worst scenario. Great White turned out to be super aggressive, beat up anyone who came near and took over. It would mean they would always be frightened of their own shadow. Hmm... Morgana's right for once. Something must be done. Suddenly, Morgana tensed, then whispered down to Moriarty. I see him. I think he's going into Vinny's garden. Come up here and watch. Vinny will scare the daylights out of him, no problem. Moriarty scampered up the apple tree, and they both climbed higher so they had the best view over the fence through the bare twigs. Great White was sitting on a fence post just beyond Vinny's patch, two gardens over. He was sniffing the air and surveying the terrain. From their vantage point, they could see the conservatory door of Vinny's house was open, a sure sign that he was either in the garden or in the conservatory watching. Should we warn Great White about Vinny? asked Moriarty. After all, if we do, he might be grateful to us and be friendly. Morgana looked scornfully at him. No, let's leave Finny to shake him up a bit. Then, while he's still jumpy, we go round and put him in his place. Great White jumped down into Vinny's garden and sauntered across the lawn right in front of the conservatory. First, they heard a yapping coming from within the house. Then came a scrabbling of claws on the wooden floor of the conservatory. Finally, a brown and white Jack Russell came tearing out, barking the bark of a much bigger dog. Moriarty and Morgana grinned at each other as Vinny made a noisy beeline for Great White. He turned his head towards the noise, and they thought he was going to make a run for it. But he didn't. He turned sideways onto Vinny, screeched a low, strangled, growling screech, and marched purposefully towards the dog, hissing like a steam train, with his fur twice the size it was before. Vinny skidded to a halt just short of Great White, and stopped yapping. Nothing had ever stood up to him before, and he didn't know what to do. Great White marched on relentlessly and took a vicious swipe at Vinny's nose. He yelped, and scurried back into his house. Great White sat in the middle of Vinny's lawn and casually licked his paw. Moriarty couldn't believe his eyes. Great White had just seen off Vinny. A feeling of dread came over him. Oh dear, he said. I don't think the two of us are enough to scare him. Why don't we appeal to his better nature? Tell him we want to be friends. No, said Morgana decisively. We are going to stand up to the brute, but we need all the help we can get. We'll round up the other cats. They won't want to be bullied by the brute either. I'll go see Mia. Can you find Ginge and talk him into joining our gang? Don't bother with the kitten. Four of us will be enough for him, surely. He's coming this way, cried Moriarty. Quick, back indoors. They leapt down from the apple tree and scrambled in through the cat flap before Great White appeared. From the kitchen window sill they watched him plod across their lawn, leap over the six-foot fence with ease, and into their neighbours. Ginge doesn't come out till the afternoon, said Moriarty. A little thought and sleep is called for. I'll contact him later. 
Morgana nodded grimly and headed upstairs to Tom's room. His bed was the comfiest. Moriarty went into the lounge, hoping for a lap. Mum and Dad were up, watching the breakfast news on the telly, but he remembered it was a work day, so they would soon be off. No point going for a lap. He settled on an empty chair. It was comfy, and he could easily hear what they were saying. Usually it was just boring nonsense about some human news story, or what they were having for dinner that night. Moriarty's ears pricked up, though, when he heard Mum say, "'Those new people round the corner seem nice. I had a quick chat with them yesterday on my way back from the bus stop. They were unloading their car. They've got a white cat. Just saw it in the garden. Anyway, you'll have to laugh. They call him Blofeld from the Bond films. Apparently he's quite vicious.' Moriarty closed his eyes. That was just what he needed, an evil, power-mad cat bent on world domination. He started casting his mind about for any other cat they could rope into their gang. There was Ringo at the end of the close, but he was quite a long way off. Would he be interested? He pondered further for a few minutes, then fell into a disturbed, dreamy sleep where giant white cats stroked bald men's heads and laughed maniacally. Morgana found Tom's bed, but unfortunately Tom was still in it. She scolded him and pawed at the covers, trying to tell him he needed to get up as it was a school day. Tom finally relented, got up, and left a nice warm patch for her to snuggle down on. Princesses didn't need to worry about things too much, she thought. That's what Moriarty is for. Morgana was soon asleep. Moriarty yawned and glanced at the clock above the telly three o'clock. Ginge will be about now. I'll go find him. He poked his nose out of the cat flap to make sure the coast was clear, then tiptoed noiselessly out. He was on edge and constantly looking around for signs of great white. Morgana was right. I'm already looking over my shoulder, and I haven't even met him yet. He found Ginge in his usual spot on the shed roof in his garden. It was still a cool day, being early spring, but the sun was warm. Moriarty called up. Ginge, can I join you? Despite their being friends, it was always good etiquette to ask another cat if you wanted to come into their inner sanctum. Oh, hi, Moriarty. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's chew the cud together. Moriarty hopped up the side of the shed with two bounds and sat next to Ginge. I've been watching out for that newcomer, said Ginge. Oh, great white, said Moriarty. Ginge laughed, then went on. Well, he cut straight across my garden about an hour ago. He looked at me and just sneered. Ginge hung his head in shame. You know what, me old mucker? I just let him go. Pretended I was asleep and hadn't seen him. He's so big, and I'm not as young as I used to be. Of course, in the old days, I'd have had him. No worries. But now... Well, I got this arthritis in me right leg. You did the right thing, Ginge, said Moriarty. We watched him this morning. He went into Vinny's garden. Vinny came rushing out, all snarling and vicious, and Great White just squared up to him, actually advanced on Vinny, gave him a nasty swipe on the snout. I almost felt sorry for the mutt. Ginge's jaw dropped. And to think if I'd challenged him, I might not have lived to tell the tale. Moriarty knew Ginge liked to exaggerate a bit, but he let it go. Cats rarely injured other cats that badly. It was all about a show of strength. I could kill you, but I won't this time. If we do nothing, then he'll have won without a fight, said Moriarty. We figure if all of us, say you, me, Morgana and Mia, corner him head on, we can persuade him that he'd better not try to bully us. Wow, I've never thought of cats ganging up before. Not a bad idea, though. I'm in. But I'll stay at the back if it's okay with you. Morgana was having a similar discussion with Mia. Mia said, The big bully just strolled through my land without asking. He even bared his teeth at me when I said how rude he was. I've never seen such an enormous cat, even on the telly when we watch those wildlife programs with lions and tigers. 
Are you sure he isn't a snow leopard or something? Morgana explained the plan. The four of them would read Great White, the Riot Act. Follow the etiquette or else. Mia agreed enthusiastically. We Siamese are a proud race and great warriors. Uh, but in this case, safety in numbers is a good idea. You do the talking. I'll be right behind you, OK? Morgana and Mia trotted off to Ginger's house, keeping a wary eye out for Great White. They reached his shed without trouble, gathered sombrely. Morgana took the lead, as befitting royalty, thinking a rousing speech would galvanise them all. We have come together for the first and maybe the last time, she announced pompously. The threat to our way of life is very real, and we must stand shoulder to shoulder, paw to paw. We will confront the brute. Uh, his name is Blofeld, by the way, chirped Moriarty. Morgana gave him a withering stare, then carried on. Confront Blofeld and read him the Riot Act. He must ask before crossing our lands, and, er, uh, well, generally be nice and not kill us all. Who's with me? She looked expectantly at them, hoping for cheers and paw-thumping. There was an awkward silence. Then Ginge cleared his throat and said, Blofeld. Oh dear, that's a bad sign. Uh, well, OK, we're right behind you, Morgana. Y you tell him. Blofeld, you say? muttered Mia with a frown. Finally, she nodded too. She turned and whispered to Ginge, if this all goes wrong, it was their idea, right? Ginge nodded. Come on then, gang. No time like the present. Moriarty, you lead. Moriarty swivelled his eyes. Why me? This is your... But Morgana stared him out, and he took a deep breath. OK. I saw him just now in his garden. A good place to corner him, on his own turf. Moriarty led glancing back regularly to make sure they were all right behind him. We all get up on this fence. If he's there, we all go, right? No last minute leaving us in the lurch. We'll go if you go, said Ginge. Almost as one, they leapt up to the top of the fence that gave into Blofeld's garden. Ginge needed two attempts, on account of me bad knee. There he is. Morgana and I will lead. You two stay right behind. Look stern and back us up. Moriarty leapt down smoothly, followed quickly by Morgana. Ginge hesitated, but Mia shoved him. All four marched like a phalanx towards the sleeping white cat. The enormous sleeping white cat. Blofeld was lying in a pool of sunshine on the grass in the back garden. As they approached, he opened one blue eye, and then the other green eye. The gang stopped, barely a pause swipe away, with Morgana in front, Moriarty on her shoulder. They sat in unison and stared at Blofeld. "'What do you lot want?' asked Blofeld in a deep gravelly voice. Morgana's heart was thumping. "'Well, at least he hasn't killed us yet. Be brave. We have come here to warn you that we won't tolerate you just swanning through our lands. There are procedures, you know. Blofeld yawned, lifted a paw, and examined it intently for a moment. Then he flicked out a single claw. It was at least twice the length of Morgana's. He looked up at them all. You know, I've moved around a fair bit. Never settled. And I blame my humans for that. But wherever I go, I get hostility and fear. No cat wanted me on their patch. They never talked to me. They either ran off or told me angrily to get lost. He looked around the four cats arrayed before him. You don't scare me. I could rip your throats out. There was an awkward silence. Moriarty stepped forward boldly. Is that what you want? Murder four cats so you can be lord of the manor? Blofeld stared unblinking into Moriarty's eyes. I could start with you. I doubt I'll need to kill the others. Blofeld raised one eyelid, then laughed and examined his claw critically. Moriarty felt a shiver down his back. 
He glanced and noticed that Ginge and Mia were edging backwards slowly. Was this it? Was Blofeld going to make an example of him, to keep the others in line? Blofeld dropped his stare, and then his body began to shake, and a low mournful howl came from him. A giant tear fell from his left eye. In a hushed, trembling voice he cried, Why does every cat I meet hate me? Then he turned from them, bowed his head, and plodded away. Moriarty turned to his compatriots. Was it something I said? Eh, hey, we won, cried Ginge. No, said Moriarty quietly. I think we misjudged him. I knew we should just have talked to him instead of assuming he was a big bully. With that, he turned back to Blofeld, who was just about to disappear into the bushes. Hey, uh, Mr. Blofeld, come back. Maybe we got off on the wrong tack. Why can't we all just get along? Wanna be friends? Morgana hissed quietly at him. What are you doing? We got him on the run. Ginge and Mia looked at each other in astonishment. Be friends with the brute? Blofeld stopped and turned. They could see he was still crying. Come on, tell us a funny story, Mr. Blofeld. You got a funny story? said Moriarty in his most friendly voice. Blofeld wiped the tears from his eyes and lifted his head. Really? Then he grinned and bounded back. Call me Ernst. He looked eagerly from one to the other. Oh, uh, right, Ernst, said Moriarty. Now, this is Morgana, I mean Princess Morgana. Morgana fluffed herself up. She was not totally happy with the situation, but if Blofeld acknowledged her as a princess, well, that would be a good start. Pleased to meet you, Ernst. Blofeld bowed courteously. And this is Ginge and Mia. Ginge has been here the longest and knows everyone. Watch your Ernst, said Ginge, with an embarrassed chuckle. Sorry if we came across all rude. Hello, said Mia. Blofeld sighed deeply and grinned. I don't want trouble, and it would be great to have a nice quiet life for a change. You say you want a funny story? Something that's happened to me? He settled down next to them. This is true, by the way, he said, and winked. It was a dark and stormy night.